Before we get started, if you're enjoying this content, you can do us a favor by subscribing to our YouTube channel and ringing the bell. That'll let the algorithm know that you like this content and it will help us produce more. Your email doesn't have to be perfect, but if it's perfect for your audience and it has the right boxes checked, then you're going to win. Welcome to Honest Ecommerce, a podcast dedicated to cutting through the BS and finding actionable advice for online store owners. I'm your host, Chase Clymer, and I believe running a direct-to-consumer brand does not have to be complicated or a guessing game. On this podcast, we interview founders and experts who are putting in the work and creating real results. I also share my own insights from running our top Shopify consultancy, Electric Eye. We cut the fluff in favor of facts to help you grow your e-commerce business. Let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Honesty Commerce. I'm your host, Chase Clymer. And today, I'm welcoming to the show, Chase Diamond. How are you doing today, Chase? Doing well, thanks, man. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Uh, Happy New Year. Uh, Thank you so much for coming back on. Our original episode is done goofed. (laughs) I don't know what happened to it. Uh, but Chase was uh, nice enough to come back on, and, and we're going to chat. Uh, uh, so for those those that are unaware, I guess, what would you say your claim to fame in the industry is? Claim to fame? Oh, man. I don't think I'm anywhere near famous. But at this point, now I've sent north of a couple billion emails and done north of $100 million in email revenue for clients in the past four or so years. And then maybe the fact that if you follow me on Twitter, you get nonstop notifications left, right, and center. Yeah, you definitely got a, a a nice following of passionate individuals. And it's not only that you are, you know, your agency does amazing things with helping your clients do email revenue. And don't worry, everyone listening, we're going to dive into some of that stuff here in a bit. Um, but you're also very passionate about entrepreneurship and like helping others build businesses. Yeah, and I think it stems from like how I got started. I got started in marketing through necessity when I was, you know, 13 years old. I got diagnosed with Crohn's disease, and I basically was sick for the entirety of a year, got missed diagnoses after missed diagnoses. So at 14 years old, I basically taught myself, you know, guerrilla marketing. I was taking ads out in the paper. I was doing restaurant fundraisers. I was doing walks. I was calling friends. You know, I was using AIM to message them, you know, sending emails. I really learned email through that regard of raising awareness and fundraising. So I've really come from, I don't want to say like this altruistic place, but really just this place of wanting to help others. And obviously it helps me in return, but I really do care about people and want to see them be their best self. And I just happen to talk about email and agency. And I also talk about my family, this side and the other. So I, I don't know a lot, but I share what I'm learning. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, the first thing, if you guys aren't following Chase on Twitter, if you're not into the Twitter game, like Chase is a good first follow in, in the e-commerce space. Um, so we are recording this first week of January 2022. So we just came out of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and all, all that stuff for a very tactical specific question you know like what's working now in kind of the e-commerce retention marketing atmosphere uh what are you what are you uh, you know seeing working for your clients what kind of trends or whatnot yeah i kind of want to preface like you know i think when i think about email everyone's always looking for like that silver bullet right like what's that secret that you're doing that's gonna just take me from zero to hero right And, and the reality is like there really isn't that much that we're doing that's rocket science you know to do email really well it's A, being really consistent and you know B, knowing which levers to pull, right? So it's making sure that you're sending enough campaigns per week. For some brands, that might be two campaigns a week. For another brand, that might be upwards of four or five campaigns per week. It's really making sure that on the automation, the flow side of the house, that you've got coverage across uh, pre and post purchase, everything on the pre side from like the welcome series for non-buyers, through the abandoned cart, through the abandoned checkout, the back in stock, all the way to the post purchase side, like the customer thank you. The cross sells, the upsells, you know, the win backs, the breakup series, right? So doing those two things and obviously knowing which segments to hit when you send campaigns really is like the fundamentals of email. And if you do that well, you know, that's 80% of the lift, right? That's going to drive a majority of your revenue. So that's like the, the basis, right? Like I'm not going to teach you anything that's like rocket science or silver bullets. I'm going to teach you to pick the right segments, to send the right number of campaigns and make sure that you have the funnel filled out with all the automations. That's one. Two, um, I was kind of thinking about and talking to my team and even sharing on social like what some of my thoughts were around 2020 on some of the predictions and challenges and what to focus on. And, and my thoughts here are like with iOS 14, I was 14.5, I was 15, right? It feels like the amount of data we have as marketers is diminishing by the day, yet personalization is just as important, if not more important, right? And how do you, how do, you do that? You really have to aggregate as much data as you can back into your ESP. 
you know, uh, email service provider, right? Klaviyo, OmniSend, Privia, wh- whoever you use, right? Tying as much data back in as possible. Everything from how you actually acquired that subscriber, uh, organic, affiliate, paid, you know, search, whatever that might be, all the way through like what actions are they or are they not taking? You know, they were active on your homepage. They were viewing this product. They added that product to cart. They started checkout. They made a purchase. They're reading this blog post, right? We really have to do as much as we can to aggregate that data so that way it's usable. Um, so personalization is just as important, if not more important in 2022. It's just a little bit more difficult for us to actually leverage and utilize because we're seeing less and less data out of certain platforms. Um, you know, I think SMS is a channel that's going to be even more prevalent. I think over the past year and a half or two years, um, the increase and in, in the adoption of it's been through the roof. And I think SMS paired with email is going to be you know, a massive channel. And I think you have to use the two in tandem. Everyone, I feel like always talks about it, you know, being an or situation. I think it's an and, um, you know, outside of that, with kind of some of the work that we're doing with kind of a tool that I'm building with other technology available in the marketplace, you know, I think designing emails that have an experience is super important. Um, and that's beyond just a GIF, right? A GIF is cool, but like it, t- it goes much further. So there's this thing called AMP, which is accelerated mobile pages, which allow emails to interact much like a landing page where you can actually scroll between a product carousel within an email. You can leave a review within an email. You can fill out a survey within an email. And in the future, probably not too distant future, you could also probably even transact within an email. So those are kind of some of my my high-level thoughts. And the last thing I'll throw in there is I talked about design, and that's super important. But I also think on the same note, you have to mix in more plain text emails, right? So it's really when you design emails, making sure that they are designing for a specific experience in mind. And then when you're not doing beautifully designed emails, Mixing in plain text, uh, emails from the founders, the community spokesperson, whoever that might be, to be more personal and human and potentially have a better chance at inboxing. So that was a lot, but that's kind of what I've got for you. Oh, no, dude. I I wrote down a bunch of questions here. So I'm just going to go from top to bottom. So uh, the first thing that you mentioned is like, there's no silver bullet, really comes down to consistency, right? Um, so within consistency, you know, it, 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 you kind of find this cadence that works for your brand. You know, it might be once a month, then once a week, and then multiple times a week. I think that a lot of brands are scared to send too much, right? Yeah. Um, so is there a metric that you should be looking for as far as, you know, how often should you be sending something to look for to know if you can send more or maybe start to send less? Yeah, and I, I think to answer that question, you know, with two ways. One is I think brands always think they're sending too much, but in, free, in actuality, they're probably sending too infrequently, right? They're not sending enough. And then two, the way in which you do that is it's really simple, right? You start with one campaign per week. You're going to want to look at things like the positive engagement rates. That's things like the opens, the clicks, the conversions, those types of things. And on the flip side, the negative engagement things. It's like unsubscribes, market spams, and bounces. And you'll have to look to see, you know, based on your industry and based off your historical data and which segments you're hitting, what's your open rates, your click through, what all these metrics are, right? Um, and if they're in line with industry average, if they're looking good, if they look healthy, then you send a second per week, right? And you kind of keep going down this adding one additional per week until you find this friction point. And that friction point is when the positive things decrease, right? The open rates decrease, the click throughs decrease, the conversions decrease, and the negative things increase, right? The market spam increases, the bounce increases, the unsubscribed increases, right? We don't want that to happen. So if that happens, let's say when you send four emails per week, you know that equilibrium for you most often is probably sending three per week, right? Some weeks you're going to send two, other weeks you might send four. But on average, you should aim for that three kind of because you want to maximize the number of campaigns that you're sending while minimizing the churn. But you don't want to send too frequently that you have no churn, right? Churn is actually a decent thing. People get scared of unsubscribes. But if you have no unsubscribes, you're not sending enough. You're not sending things that people actually are going to resonate with. You're kind of being vanilla. You're kind of in this no man's land. Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. So um, I had another uh, email marketer on the podcast. Uh, and I am drawing a blank. And I'm hopefully we can find it and put it in the show notes. Um, but he uh, he had an interesting take on this. And he was like, if you really wanted a, just one metric to look at, he's like, if you are unsubscribes or under 1%, you can probably send more emails. Yeah. Yeah. So off the top of my head, kind of going through all the metrics, like, you know, again, open rate's a little bit kind of a gray thing right now, but historically like a 20% open rate or higher has been a good metric to see how that looks. On the click through, obviously, right, the click through is going to vary drastically depending on industry, segment, campaign, content, whatnot. Um, so that's a little bit harder to give one for. Um, on the spam, I think you're allowed to have one out of 1,000, right? So it's like point 
zero one or something, right? Like you're, you're able to have a really low number of spams. That's the most delicate. Balances, yeah, typically 1% or lower. Uh, I think a lot of our campaigns, at least for like my personal newsletters and some clients are like, uh, you know, 0.2, 0.5, right? Doesn't typically go above like, you know, half a percent, but I think upwards of like, you know, one, one and a half percent is pretty accurate. Balanced again, you want that to be sub one or 2%. So each metric has a slightly different um, acceptability. Um, Mark to spam is the most strict because obviously spam complaints mm-hmm. are the most serious. Um, and things like open rates, right? If you're at like an 18% open rate and you're not a 20, you know, you're pretty close. You know, there's a big difference though between a, a 5%, a 10% and a 20% open rate, right? Absolutely. No, no, no. And, and that was great. Thanks for diving into all the rest of those metrics for us. Now, um, so with, you know... Uh, a lot of the listeners are going to be like, dang, Chase and Chase are both telling me I need to send more emails. Um, and the next kind of hurdle for them, and I hear this from my clients, and I, I don't know if you hear it from your clients, and it's just like, we would love to send more emails. Yeah. We just don't have the capacity to think of more things to do. Um, so what is your advice there? Yeah. I mean, dude, there's so much inspiration around us. Like, You could literally an ad that you get that has an interesting UGC model, right? Like UGC, not a specific model, but like the way that they actually displayed the UGC, that might be an email. Uh, A conversation that you had with your friend or family member, right? That might be interesting. There might be a way to tie that in. There's kind of like these overarching seven to nine buckets of campaign contents that we look to send. And it's really important that you diversify the campaign content. Some of those buckets, uh, most people know about these first few you know, holidays, right? There's a holiday in every given month. There's also some made up holidays, right? If you sell products for pets, right? There's like National Dog Day, National Cat Day, um, you know, National Sibling Day, whatever it might be. Um, you know, aside from that, people are, you know, on a monthly, quarterly, semi-annual or annual basis dropping new products or new collections. That's an email, right? And you can even have multiple emails for that. You could have an email that hypes the product launch, an email announcing the product launch, and then an email reminding the product launch, right? That's three emails right there. Going back to the holiday, you could tease that you're having a holiday sale. You can announce a holiday sale and then you can have the sale ending, right? So you really can get kind of creative and come up with a few ideas and extract as much juice from it. Outside of that, you know, you've got things like if you ever partner with a celebrity or an influencer, doing like a celebrity or an influencer based email, curating the content of the product or the whatever it is that you work with them on. Um, current events, right? Maybe there's something happening in the sports world or this world or that world that you want to kind of talk about. Uh, there's things like testimonials, social proof, UGC. There's blog content. There's education content, right? Uh, there's gifting. There's giveaways. So I don't know how many I just named, but there's like seven to nine kind of overarching buckets that we really focus on. And there's almost more. I actually have the inverse problem. My problem is that there's so many things that sound like, what in the world do you send, right? Where it sounds like a lot of people probably have the idea of like, I don't know what to send. There's nothing to send. I, I'm on the other side. Like, There's so much to send. It's like, how do you pick just one? And that's why you send two, three, four, five emails a week. And you go between sales and then products and then holidays and then UGC and whatnot. That was a fantastic answer. So uh, my follow-up there would be with how do you combat uh, perfectionism when it comes to email marketing? I feel like there is a... Uh, people are constantly comparing what they're doing to you know, the big, the big dogs in the D2C space. So what would you say to kind of like help people that that are waiting to press send, I guess. Yeah. I mean, dude, for, for me personally, like all the big brands I follow, there are, a lot of them are just like so basic. And I know I talked about like there's no silver bullets, right? But they're, they're basic in the sense that like their stuff really isn't exciting or entertaining or interesting, right? A lot more of these smaller, you know, six, seven, maybe low eight figure brands are the ones that are way more innovative and creative and fun. So I think just because of, you know, b- big brands are always sending like one image emails, right? Like, and they have no, you know, stuff behind it and it doesn't load and it doesn't render. It's and accessible, can't search for it in your, in your, uh, exactly your, whatever email platform you're on. Yeah. So like, look, not to knock big brands, obviously they're probably doing certain things for some reasons and other things they just probably don't know best practices. Right. Um, so there's a lot to learn, but there's also a lot that these big brands are just not doing right at all. And I'd look at some of these like fast growing seven, eight figure brands that are just crushing it and kind of more benchmarking compared to them. That being said, like, you are different than the big brands. And what's going to work for you is actually different than what's going to work for them. I feel like a couple of years ago, that used to be this whole thing of like, you wanted to only buy from Nordstrom's and Macy's and these trustworthy brands. And now today, I feel like through the pandemic and everything else, everything is about like shopping local, smorning small business. And people, I think before used to pretend that they were way bigger. And now they're leaning into the fact that they're smaller. 
I think all of those things are advantages. You know, and when we work with clients, like every client we work with is slightly different in terms of like how they approach things. We've got some clients on one end of the spectrum that want every single email to be pixel perfect. And we go through six rounds of iterations and they're still not happy, even though it's like 99.9% of the way there. And we've got other clients that are just like, hey, we trust you. You guys know what you're doing. We care more about conversion than we do branding and beautiful looking emails, right? So it really is a case by case basis. At the end of the day, like you have no idea what these other brands metrics are or aren't. So it's almost like what got you to open? What got you to click? What got you to buy? What's that feeling? What's that psychology? And do the best that you can to emulate and resonate that. Obviously, don't copy it, but take the good from this brand and the good from this brand and the good from this brand and take the bad from those brands and really kind of come up with this email that has most of the goods and fewer of the bads that really is for you. So I I just think like if you're going to want to be a copycat brand, there's like no point to even do any of this, right? Like if you want to be different and you built a brand with a mission and a vision, stay true to that. And who cares what other people are doing, right? When they zig, you zag, right? Don't don't copy them. No, that, that's fantastic advice. And uh, what you kind of said there is uh, you, you can't really compare yourself to these other brands because you don't know what is happening on the other end of that. And kind of what I have been saying a lot lately to our clients and, and prospects and stuff like that, it's like emails are almost like with with like ads it's like we don't know how it's going to perform just press send and find out if it sucked okay we learned not to do that again i think being scared of pressing send is like is a bad habit to have just because like the i've gotten so many emails even from big brands where they're just like ignore that last one we goofed like here's the real one and no one cares yeah 100 percent. and to your point like when you press send you learn so much about your subject lines, your offers, your creative, and, and more in particular, your audience. And that's really like the big difference is like, you might have two beauty brands that sell makeup, but their audiences might be so different. One might be for, you know, women over 50, and one might be for women 18 to 25, right? And the way in which those folks are going to interact and engage with your emails is going to be so different. For the audience that's 50 and older, you know, you might want to go more like plain text and really large fonts that way it's accessible and readable on iPads or whatever that they're using, Outlook, you know, Yahoo, you want to make sure that like they're able to read it and engage and interact. And it's a little bit more straightforward. Whereas with a younger demo that sells a similar product for a a different audience, you might want to be more design heavy, more GIFs, more animation, a little bit more clever and witty and fun. So I think that's the other thing too, is like, you could look at all these brands, but without having their demo be the same as your demo, it doesn't matter what they do versus what you do as long as you're doing what's on brand and what feels right for your specific audience. I think that's the most important part is like your email doesn't have to be perfect, but if it's perfect for your audience and it has the right boxes checked, then you're going to win. If you're struggling with scaling your sales, maybe Electric Eye can help. Our team has helped our clients generate millions of dollars in additional revenue through our unique brand scaling framework. You can learn more about our agency at electriceye.io. That's E L E C T R I C E Y E.io. Mesa is the expansion pack for your Shopify store to level up your brand. By turning all your apps into your business epicenter, Mesa can help lighten your workload and tame the day to day chaos of running your store. Join successful brands like Mudwater, Chubby's, and Golden to learn how to use clever workflows to get more done without more overhead. Whether you need to order details in Google Sheets, products added on Etsy, or customer information updated in your CRM, Mesa connects your data where it's needed most. To put it quite simply, Mesa is a better way to work. Browse pre-made templates for Shopify's most popular apps to get your first automation up and running in minutes. Search Mesa, that's M-E-S-A, in the Shopify App Store and download the app today. Is your store holiday ready? Now is the time to make sure you and your team are prepared for the busy season ahead. Gorgeous, an omni-channel help desk built for e-commerce has machine learning functionality that takes the pressure off small support teams and gives them the tools to manage a large number of inquiries at scale, especially during the holiday season. Gorgeous combines all your different communication channels like email, SMS, social media, live chat, and even phone into one platform and gives you an organized view of all your customer inquiries. Their powerful functionality can save your support team hours per day and makes managing customer orders a breeze. Merchants can close tickets faster than ever with the help of pre-written responses integrated with customer data to increase the overall efficiency of customer support. 
Their built-in automations also free up time for support agents to give better answers to complex product-related questions, providing next-level support, which helps increase sales, brand loyalty, and recognition. Eric Bandholtz, the founder of Beard Brand, says, We're a seven-figure business, and we have essentially one person on customer support and experience. It's impossible to do it without tools such as Gorgeous to help us innovate. Learn how to level up your customer support by speaking to their team. Visit gorgeous.grsm.io slash honest. Mention this podcast when you sign up to get two months free. That's G-O-R-G-I-A-S dot G-R-S-M dot I-O slash H-O-N-E-S-T. Our partner Rewind can protect your Shopify store with automated backups of your most important data. Rewind should be the first app you install to protect your store against human error, misbehaving apps, and collaborators gone bad. It's like having your very own magic undo button. Trusted by over 100,000 businesses, from side hustles to the biggest online retailers like NYX, Gatorade, and Movement Watches. Best of all, respond to any of their welcome emails and mention this podcast, Honest Ecommerce, and get your first month absolutely free. Getting an online business off the ground isn't easy. So if you find yourself working late, tackling a to-do list that's a mile long with your fifth cup of coffee by your side, remember... Great email doesn't have to be complicated. That's what Klaviyo is for. It's the email and SMS platform built to help e-commerce brands earn more money by creating genuine customer relationships. Once you set up your free Klaviyo account, you can start sending beautiful branded messages in minutes thanks to drag and drop design templates and built-in guidance. And with e-commerce specific recommendations and insights, you can keep growing your business as you go. Get started with a free account at klaviyo.com slash honest. That's K-L-A-V-I-Y-O dot com slash H-O-N-E-S-T. You mentioned this a bit before, uh, and it resonated with me and made me remember a funny story, which was um, it is a little less popular these days because of the advent of kind of like builders within kind of email platforms but basically like everyone was like comparing themselves to these big brands that would just basically like have a huge one image email and it would be you could kind of just make it look like whatever you wanted yeah. um and uh what when we were talking about that i remembered once i saw an offer in one of these emails actually that i wanted and so i went back after i'd archived it and i was trying to search for this thing and because the image was just one big image. Like it actually wasn't searching for the text that I read in the email and I literally couldn't find it and they lost the sale from it. Um, so that's just like, you know, that's one detriment of having these whole, uh, like one large image design within your emails. Um, so I got a, maybe one or two part question here. It's like, well, like what is your recommendation with, uh, you know, fully designed out emails like that? Um, you know, is that something that you'd recommend these days, or is there a different way that you tell people to approach tr- a more design oriented email? Yeah, look, I, I understand why people do that. They do it for a few reasons. One is you have a lot more control of how your design actually looks, right? You can have custom fonts, your you know your exact colors. Everything is going to look the same across you know device, right? You, so you you have more control of the the visual aspect. Also, too, like I think there's two other reasons. One is people just don't know that it's not a best practice. And two, or, or maybe three would be the fact that like, they're just time constrained, right? So um, they want control, they don't know that it's bad, or they maybe know that it's not the best, but yet they have no better process. And they are doing six other things. And it's just an email, right? I think a lot of people are like, it's just an email, like, who cares? Like, I've got way more important pressing things to do outside of the inbox. Um, so I think that's why people do it. You know, in my opinion, like, again, I get it. It's not a best practice. I don't recommend it. But if that's all that you can do, and that's the difference between you sending emails or not, do it. By all means, do it. It's better than, than not doing it at all. In, yeah. in a perfect world, you know, I think uh, there's a couple ways to do it. One would be to you know custom code an email. It's not just an image; it's custom coded. But again, that has barriers to entry. Like it's a little bit more technical. The, the other aspect is le- leveraging blocks, right? Using modular templates. And there's obviously going to be an image block. There's going to be a text block. But in this case, right, because it's modular, the text itself is actually going to be live. It's not going to just be a text on an image where there you're going to have now a nice ratio between uh, images and text. You know, different platforms, different folks say different things. You know, there's this company called Spam Assassin that says you want 60% text, 40% images. Other people say, you know, 6% images, 40% text is fine. So pretty much you want to be as one-to-one as possible between text and images. And it's not always the case. In some emails, you're going to have 75% text, 25% imagery, 
or 75% imagery, 25% text. But that's kind of like the, the better practice is having modulars and blocks that are images and text-based and button-based. That will be better. And then obviously I mentioned before, even just sending emails that are plain text emails is also something I think folks should mix in. You touched on so many cool things already within this podcast. And just to kind of highlight some of them, you know, the first one being is like, you know, kind of just press send, you know, and then it, the other one is like, you probably aren't sending enough. So press send more uh, and then experiment with what you're doing. Try new uh, kind of motivations behind the emails at, you know, conversational or, or you know, product, you know, not it doesn't always have to be a sale. It doesn't always have to be a holiday. Um we also touched on a little bit uh, SMS. So let's talk about kind of, uh, you know, what is the difference between like, uh, you know, you said it isn't one or the other, you know, it isn't email or SMS. It's kind of email and SMS. So how do you kind of want to paint the picture for people of how they can, if they don't have this in their current strategy, like how they should kind of bring it into their strategy? Yeah, full transparency. Email is my thing through and through. SMS is something that I understand at a high level. It's something that we offer at the agency. So it's something that I'm actively kind of learning. We've got someone that's better than me at SMS in that place. That being said, like, I think on the SMS side, some of my learnings are a couple of things. You know, SMS obviously is a little bit more delicate of a channel. And what I mean by that is like, you shouldn't go be sending three to five text messages a week, right? I think on most part, like we found one text, maybe two texts a week to kind of be that sweet spot. Anything more than that, it's a little bit obtrusive. The one caveat being is if you tell people ahead of time that they should expect multiple texts per message per week, um, before they opt in or as they opt in, then that's kind of the caveat, right? In most cases, if you don't specify, you should expect maybe one text message a week to be sent, potentially two. However, if you're going to say, yo, Chase, you know, just to give you a heads up, as you enter your phone number here, you can expect three texts a week from us or you can expect a daily text. If they have that you know, info up front, then you're cool sending more. That's one. Two is I, get, I think I get the question probably every couple of days at this point of like, well, aren't you worried as an email marketer that SMS is going to take away from the revenue that you're showing and this, that, and the other? And it's like, look, you know, I think the more revenue that both channels provide, whether it's accurate or it's misattribution or not, the, the better. Like our, our goal when we work with folks, whether we're doing just email or email and SMS, is to help them lift up their own revenue. And if SMS plays a part of that, then that's great. Um, so I think people are too worried about that, especially as they're offering one service or the other. They're worried that SMS is going to steal their attribution piece of the pie, right? Um, and in some cases it might, but in other cases it's going to help lift conversion. I like SMS for things that are a lot more time sensitive and kind of, I guess, newsworthy or kind of you know important. Whereas email is much better for things that are longer form. Obviously, right there's some urgency and there's importance to emails, but you know I think leveraging text messages for like a flash sale is a great one. I think leveraging text messages for Hey, you know, important update about your shipping might be a good one. Um, you know, it's just something that's like really important. Every time we think about sending a text message before we press send, we ask ourselves is like, could this be an email? Should this be a text? You know, if it could be an email and it doesn't necessarily have to be a text, we'll kind of scrap it and we'll just turn it into an email. People don't necessarily need to receive it right away. It's not that important or that urgent. Um, and we like to use it, for example, like in the abandoned cart sequence or like the abandoned checkout sequence to go back and forth between email and text. So we might lead with an email saying, hey, Chase, you left this in your cart. Check out. If you don't purchase, we might follow up with a text message, right? And if you check out, we then pause sending anything else. So we kind of go back and forth between like emails and text to see how we can get someone, you know, within an abandoned cart, abandoned checkout. Typically, like that first 24 to 72 hours is the most important in terms of getting someone to convert. You know, after the 72 hour mark, we've probably lost that sale or maybe they're just going to come back to us later. Um and then, you know, SMS and email, we, we kind of cover similar topics in terms of the bo- like the bodies and the buckets of co- content that we go through, um, but they don't, you don't need them to be the same. And we'll also exclude people if we can that are receiving text from not receiving emails and vice versa. So that way they're not just getting two of the same if the content happens to be pretty similar. That's a lot of amazing advice. Uh, I think uh, what you mentioned with the uh, stealing attribution, I thought that was really funny. And I think that the industry as a whole has this... Uh, a, a, a bad perspective on attribution and they lend not lend that's the wrong term but they basically everyone's looking at last click attribution yep. which is like not how customers shop uh and you know i've seen a lot of really cool uh solutions coming into the market these days on you know explaining the entire customer journey and the attribution that is is being 
it isn't being misrepresented. Two things aren't claiming the same thing. Let me tell you that. It is they were shown these ads or they did get these outreaches or or whatever. These touch points happened yes. at different parts of the journey, but within the window that you automatically allocated there. Um, and I think that once you know, merchants and and you know maybe some sometimes marketers and advertisers start to realize that like, you know, they needed to see that email before they converted on that TikTok ad, right? Like they they aren't mutually exclusive. Yeah, dude. I mean, I totally totally agree. I think with email and SMS and part of the goal there really is to build that trust and build that bond. So that way someone does convert. And whether they convert directly from that email or directly from the SMS or through a Facebook ad or they just come back to the site organically. As long as you're driving that sale, that's really important. And email and SMS do a great way at building that really intimate, exclusive kind of bond. I think that's the thing, right? So sure, mm-hmm. you have this number of attribution or this amount of revenue from these channels. Um, but in reality, like they're probably actually contributing to more revenue than they're being accounted for. And in other cases, like Facebook and Instagram and SEO are probably being the same, right? Like they're also helping increase th- that you know awareness, which then gets the sale for email. So they really are working kind of holistically together to make sure that someone does convert. And that's really the end goal. I think more people need to think about getting someone to convert is the goal. Obviously, building the relationship, building the community. But if they convert and you're profitable, then just keep doing what you're doing. Absolutely. I I couldn't agree more. I think that that, you know, they all exist for a reason and the channels work. And like at the end of the day, you got to realize that like you need to be marketing to your customers in the the channels in which that they personally are like hanging out and kind of want to be spoken to in so you know you while your customer avatar is probably very similar uh the individuals might prefer outreach on SMS versus email or you know they might like to actually sit down and and read the emails but when they're ready to shop they're going to respond to the ad you know it it user behavior is insane yeah and one other thing to add is like Okay, let's talk about like social email SMS. So yeah. you send, let's say, three emails a week. You know, if your open rate's 20%, that means one person might actually open one of your emails, right? And if you send, you know, one text message a week, again, a lot of people are going to end up opening that, right? So it's like you've got someone opening one email, got someone opening one text. If you post on social and they follow you, you know, you might post six times in a week and they might actually only see one or two, right? So we actually have to do more than we think just because... It's, you know, we're, we're kind of silly to think that every single person is going to read every text, every email, every post that we create. So that's why they all really work together is like we're, we're doing three emails a week. We're doing one text message a week. We're doing eight posts a week. But they're actually only seeing a really small sliver. And that's what's getting you to convert. And you don't know necessarily what that actually is. So you have to be really consistent and you have to do more than you think is enough because that's what's ultimately going to have these people engage and convert. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there, Chase. And like it, you mentioned it earlier, is like a lot of these brands are scared to send more emails, even though they're not sending quite enough. And a term I've literally heard from from clients and stuff is that like we don't want to bombard them. Like mm-hmm. it's this crazy, you know, weird, you know, thing that you're going to be annoying the people. But like the truth of it is, is like they're going to either open or archive that email faster than they thought about the last time they were emailed. Yeah, I think the biggest challenge, and I think this is email and this is outside of email, is like us as marketers, like we're we're wearing two hats at all given times, right? We're in this consumer mindset and we're in this marketer mindset, right? And oftentimes I think we forget what hat we're wearing. Where when we're trying to think about our email strategy, we might think we're in the marketing hat, but we're actually thinking as ourselves as consumer of like, I don't want to receive two or three emails a week necessarily from a brand. So I'm not going to send two or three to my customers, right? So we kind of have like these biases that we bring over from one world into the other. I think it's important to have compassion and empathy and awareness. But I often think too, it's almost like we forget which hat we're wearing. So we don't do this. And because we've never done this, we're never going to do it, right? It's like the self-fulfilling prophecy that just never happens. So it's kind of interesting when you think about yourself as those two people, maybe even get yourself in the frame of like, okay, I'm here thinking about my strategy for my client. I'm thinking about the strategy for my brand. You know, how am I thinking about this? Am I chase the marketer? Or my chase the consumer, and you want to you want to marry and kind of blend the two, but how it's beneficial and you see fit for your business, right? Because you're doing this for your business. Yeah, I I think that you know I agree with everything you just said, but what I do want to say is like you and I as marketers and, and being in this industry, I think that we are we we've seen the sausage get made. So like I like yeah. over analyze everything I see yeah. <laughs> when I am kind of like off the clock and in consumer mode, and I want to buy things for myself, and it's just. I sometimes have to catch myself like, Chase, like, why do you care 
just buy the buy the pants. Yeah, or like we're purposely abandoning carts to get the best discount, or you know, <laughs> we're reaching out to customer support about our subscription that we're about to cancel because we're gonna get a better discount, right? Like, you know, everyone's kind of playing the game and learning how things happen. And I think that's I think that's good. But I also think you have to realize, yeah, if you're chilling at home, study it, understand it, but don't obsess over it to the point where now you're back in work mode. And if you're at work, yep. don't just be so stuck in consumer land that you're not gonna send it and you have this fear. Um, so it's interesting. Absolutely. Now, Chase, um, is there anything that I forgot to ask you about today that you think would resonate with our audience? That's a good question. Um, man, we talked we talked about a lot. I, I don't I don't know. Um, nothing that I can think of. And if people have any questions, I'd be happy to come back on a second episode. I'm not sure if they're going to want to hear me talk again for 30 minutes. But if if we have any questions, or if your listeners have questions and they hit you up, I'd be happy to come back. Oh no, I'll definitely have you on in a couple months. Uh, maybe we'll we'll we'll. we'll plan it better and get something more timely. Uh, get Maybe like do something with like Black Friday holiday planning or something. Make sure it comes out close to there. Sweet. Um, so if people are interested in following you and learning more about, uh, you know, all the stuff that you're amazing at, where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, I think the best place is to follow me on Twitter. Within my Twitter bio, I have like a link to my free newsletter. I've got a link to a paid newsletter, a link to paid courses. Um, so my handle on Twitter is Ecom Chase Diamond, but there's no A in Diamond. So it's D-I-M-O-N-D. So Ecom Chase Diamond, no A. Absolutely. And we're going to link to that in the show notes for everybody. Chase, thank you so much for coming on the show. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. All right. I can't thank our guests enough for coming on the show and sharing their knowledge and journey with us. We've got a lot to think about and potentially add into our own business. You can find all the links in the show notes. Make sure you head over to honestecommerce.co to check out all of the other amazing content that we have. Make sure you subscribe, leave a review. And obviously, if you're thinking about growing your business, check out our agency at electriceye.io. Until next time.